Okay, hi everybody, I'm Susan Broderick and um, I'm gonna to talk to you today about recovery capital, which probably none of you have heard about. And I had mentioned it to Chris when we were talking about the fact that this is actually well-being in the law week. And um, in terms of my background, um, I am a former prosecutor. Some people say there's no such thing. <laughs> and um, I am currently um, at the National District Attorneys Association. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story because my professional and my personal lives have come together around this issue. So we all know we're heading into, you know, we thought 2020 was the worst year of our lives and here we are in 2021 and still pretty stressful. Um, and, and I think especially for those of us working within the justice system, we not only had the pandemic, there's an addiction crisis and then we also have what's going on in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. So I think that for prosecutors, especially there's a unique stress um, to what we're dealing with these days. And, you know, there's where I started my career in the Manhattan DA's office. And, um, you know, it, it's always been um, my favorite position that I ever had. Sorry, Nelson. <laughs> um, but I really, I loved being a prosecutor. It was the most rewarding and powerful positions um, I didn't do it for the power. I did it because I love to help people. Um, but I never realized um, the amount of stress that came with it. And it was actually, um, I handled everything, domestic violence, sex crimes, homicides. It was actually after a big homicide that Mr. Morgenthal said, congratulations, I'm going to put you in charge of child abuse. And I was like, that's a promotion? <laughs> and then I started doing child abuse cases and I realized how much I loved them because I loved helping children. Um, but I also recognize there was a lot of stress involved. So the thing that we know about working in the justice system is that um, addiction is a reality and it doesn't, it's an equal opportunity destroyer and really doesn't care where you sit in the courtroom. I think a lot of us have worked on cases where either the defendant or the victim um, were suffering from addiction issues, but the reality is that there's prosecutors, judges, and defense attorneys who are also suffering from addiction. So um, there's New York City. As I said, I started in 1989 and um, my drinking started way before I started as a prosecutor. Um, I come from a long line of alcoholics. I'm an Irish uh, American. So my family tree is really like a vineyard and it was a work hard, play hard environment. And I did both. And um, really a lot of my colleagues were drinking it, I thought, as much as I did. And the thing is that it really was like back in the law and order days. I, I worked in Manhattan starting in 89. And so I was there in the 90s during the height of the crime wave. And we worked a lot. And, um, you know, Forlini's was really part of our culture. It was a bar behind the office and went there very often with my colleagues. But the other thing is that I did not um, drink during the day. I did not drink in the morning, um, but it was what I went home to. And it, you know, very often it would be with colleagues after work, but then ultimately those colleagues started settling down and getting married. And I was convincing myself, well, I'm not doing that because I'm a career woman. But the reality is that um, I had a drinking problem and I couldn't sustain a relationship. And things sort of came to a head. Um, in 2001 and I realized that um, I could not continue the way I was going. I, um, on July 15th, 2001, that's the Church of St. Ignatius Loyola and I went to a meeting there, a 12 step meeting and for the first time in my life, I was honest about my drinking. And um, it, at the time, it seemed to me that it was the low point of my life and when I look back now, I realize that that really was the biggest turning point of my life. You know, when people talk about the fear of admitting that there's a problem, you know, when I look back now, even though I thought it was the worst day of my life, it probably was the most courageous day of my life. And really what happened after that, I, re I remember I, I said, my name is Susan, I'm an alcoholic and I was crying. And um, afterwards a bunch of people came up and they were hugging me. And um, I was like, well, what do I do next? And they said, "One, you have to do 90 meetings in 90 days. And I said, I thought your mantra was one day at a time. And they were like, don't argue with us. And, and that's what I did. I, I went to a meeting every single day. Um, I didn't go away to treatment. And I um, 
Fortunately, knock on wood, I'll be celebrating 20 years sobriety this coming July. And so I really, um, one of the things I dreamed about as a little girl was living in Washington, DC. And so in 2003, with two years of sobriety under my belt, I left the Manhattan DA's office and I went to work for the National District Attorneys Association. And um, I was doing child abuse work. I then started doing juvenile work. It was when I was doing juvenile work that I transferred over to Georgetown University. And um, I can tell you one thing, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not an academic. And But it really was a great experience because it exposed me to the research. It exposed me to what was going on, um, especially in regard to addiction and recovery. And um, it was a fabulous, fabulous experience. And one of the people that I met during those years was um, this professor. And his name is Dr. John Kelly. I actually met him at a conference where he was talking about the justice system providing the motivational fulcrum for so many people to um, come into recovery. And you know, one of the things, you know, as a former prosecutor, but also as a woman in recovery, I recognize that, you know, consequences matter. I, I did not get sober because things were going great. And very often for so many people, it is that consequence of coming into the justice system. And, you know, fortunately for me, I did not get referred by the justice system. And there were a lot of, um, for many years, I would deny or make excuses that I, my problem wasn't that bad. You know, I used the excuse that I was a deputy bureau chief in the Manhattan DA's office. How could I be an alcoholic? My other excuse was that I didn't have a DWI. But um, the realization that I didn't have a car in Manhattan <laughs> soon <laughs> threw that excuse out the window. And one of the things with John Kelly, um, he and I just um, immediately bonded. We started presenting together. And it was really more on addressing addiction um, within the justice system, within for offenders and, and for victims sometimes. And then it was um, probably about six or seven years ago that um, Kimberly Overton from the North Carolina Prosecutors Association contacted me and asked me to come and speak at their summer conference because she said every three years they had to do something on attorney well-being and substance use and addiction and they always would have a doctor come. And she said nobody paid attention because it was like Mary was talking about, it's the peer-to-peer -peer experience. And I'm also a breast cancer survivor. And I can tell you right now that when I got through that experience, it wasn't because of what the doctors were telling me or um, any of the experts. It really was talking to the other survivors and people who had experienced what I was experiencing and were on the other side of it. And so when I started talking about my own recovery, I, um, I would hear from other prosecutors who were struggling um, and afraid to talk about it. And one of the things when I met with John Kelly, one day we were talking about, um, and wait, let me just go back one. Um, well, anyway, we are in a unique period of time, but I just wanna go back to the conversation I had with John Kelly because he asked me to be on his advisory group at Harvard. And I said, I think it's wonderful that you're measuring and studying recovery, but I'll tell you right now, mine was a miracle because I drank alcoholically basically since I was 14. And then I went to a meeting on July 15th, 2001, and I haven't had a drink since then. I said, I don't think you can measure a miracle. And John very politely um, said, you know what? Maybe, maybe it was a miracle, Susan, or maybe you had very high recovery capital. And I was like, what the heck is recovery capital? So um, the good news is that we really are in a moment of time right now and as bad as things have gotten between the pandemic and everything that's going on in the justice system. For me, what I've always seen is that um, crisis creates opportunities and we know now more about recovery from addiction than we have ever known. And um, the good news about recovery is that there's over 23 million Americans who have successfully resolved the problem. A recent study that John Kelly did found that over half had no formal services whatsoever. Um, and so the whole idea of measuring the miracle when John had measured, um, mentioned recovery capital and I looked into it and I was like, oh my God, they measured my miracle. And so to give you a, a brief overview, recovery capital is basically looking at your individual strengths and assets. And so it's really three prongs and it's your personal, your social and your community. 
And when I looked at my own, and so personal, I just put as an example your mindset, but it really is those individual strengths you have. Um, I always had a very tough personality and sometimes it served me well, sometimes it didn't. But when it came to my recovery, um, it really did help me. And um, it also helped that my social support, my parents, um, my family, my friends were all very supportive of what I was doing, telling me how proud they were of me. Um, in terms of community support, when I got sober, I was in Manhattan. There were meetings 24 seven. I had access to peers and to people in recovery anytime, really any day of the week. And one of the things that's really exciting now is the how recovery capital really is finally becoming um, a concept that we can use, whether we're using it in our personal lives as prosecutors or whether we're incorporating it by working within the system with um, whether it's people who are charged with crimes. Um, again, with victims, I think it's a really important concept. I know that when I was a member of the sex crimes unit, I would often be talking to victims of you know sex crimes that were committed when alcohol or drugs were involved and you know what they couldn't remember details and you know the part of me that was a prosecutor would get frustrated because I, I had to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt but the part of me that was a blackout drinker totally understood what they were talking about and I empathized with them um, so what we're doing now this was actually one of my favorite studies I've been really fortunate because I worked not only with John Kelly but with another phenomenal professor from the UK, David Bess, and he's one of the leading experts on recovery capital. And one of the studies he did is he talked, they looked at people with five plus years of recovery. And they talked about, you know, like other diseases or disorders, um, you know, addiction is a potentially fatal chronic condition, but it is preventable. And the earlier the intervention, the better the prognosis. The other thing they found is that unlike other diseases or disorders, that with recovery, you, you know, with other diseases or disorders, you go to the doctor, you wanna get well, you wanna go back to what you were. With recovery, you actually transcend and you become better than well, and you become the person you're supposed to be. And I remember reading this study and, and getting chills really, because it, it brought me back to that week before I got sober. And I was actually at a um, conference down in DC. And I remember being um, so disgusted with myself and thinking this isn't who I dreamed of being as a little girl. And, and now looking back, you know, with almost 20 years of sobriety and now I'm working with prosecutors all over the country and being able to share the concept of recovery capital. And as a matter of fact, I think it was two weeks ago when um, the Biden-Harris administration issued their drug policy priorities for this year and recovery capital is included in those strategies. Um, we, Nelson and I um, have talked about the pivotal role that recovery capital can play working with prosecutors. Um, David Best and I actually just wrote an article about the pivotal role of the prosecutor um, and we talk about recovery capital. And um, again, I'm another uh, task force member Whoops, it's going, well, you've heard about our task force. And again, check out our website because we're going to be doing a lot of great work around, um, and not just the addiction component, like we talk about well-being as many things. Um, and one of the things I also wanted to talk about is, you know, we talk about trauma and stress. And, you know, now we have studies from Harvard and, and this is Dr. Kelly McGonigal from Stanford University and the whole mindset science and positive psychology and all those things that are really, so helpful um, to build resilience because we know that stress is part of life. We know that there's going to be good days, there's going to be bad days. And one of the things I feel so fortunate about is, you know, I was able to learn a lot of what this science is saying. And I learned it in church basements over the last 20 years. And I learned it from peers who had been through really rough times. And, you know, I've shared um, with some of the other panelists before we got on, like I'm in the middle of a really hard time right now. My mom um, was put into ICU last night. They thought they said her, they thought her organs were shutting down and it's really about taking care of ourselves. And so one of the things I love is the difference between illness and wellness. And 
it's I versus we. And it's that whole idea of reaching out to others and letting people know when you need support. And I was able to do that this past week because I was feeling really burnt out and really trying to juggle, you know, having a full-time job and being there for my mother. And I was reaching out to friends and just letting people know where I was. Um, and, and it's amazing what happens when you admit there's a problem and then you see the support that's out there. So how much time do I have? Um, about two minutes left. Two minutes. Okay. So um, one of the, these are some of the things that I recommend. And again, these are all things that I learned um, in the church basements and the whole one day at a time. Sometimes it's one hour at a time. And that whole idea of mindfulness and just being in the present moment is so important. Um, perspective is everything. I remember in the beginning, they told me to write um, a gratitude list every day. I was like, I don't see how that's going to keep me away from Chardonnay, but whatever. And, and what I found is that when I would focus every day looking for five things to be grateful for, that mindset, I didn't realize how negatively wired I was. And I'm sure working um, years in sex crimes and homicides and child abuse really kind of tends you towards the negative and looking for the problem, but um, really finding things to be grateful for. And even in going through this time with my mother is finding those moments where I have absolute moments of joy with her. Also finding things that bring you joy. Um, and I have to say, one of the most important things for me has been to keep a sense of humor because we have to realize that um, we're all in this together and the ability to laugh. And, and my mother actually was laughing with me yesterday, which I was like, you know what, if this is the final act of her life, bravo. She deserves a standing ovation because to, have, to be able to be that type of person. She's also in recovery, I'll just mention that. So I think um, this is a quote that I have been, um, it's actually pasted above my desk here in New York. Um, and if you wanna paste it above your desk, because I love that last line, no matter how hard the world pushes against me within me, there's always something stronger, something better pushing right back. So if any of you would like to reach out, learn more about Recovery Capital, um, I think that's it for me.